Good afternoon, everybody. Today is uh, December the 12th, about 1.30 p.m. You're going to have to bear with me. Um, this may be a lengthy video. Um, I put a lot of time into some of the research, so you're going to see me uh, jump in between computers here. I'm going to videotape with my primary com computer and read my notes off my secondary computer. The big things to realize when you're dealing with death and dying, uh, in everyday life it's one thing, but if we were to change this, and we are dealing with death and dying during a collapse situation, a disaster or anything else, that's important to realize in how you're gonna handle with that. So I'm gonna start off and explain uh, some of the things I have been through with death and dying and how it affects your uh, life. Um, I'm 50 years old. Um, both of my parents have died. I also had a son die at birth. Um, almost 20, uh, 20 years ago. So I think it's very important for me to discuss this topic so people understand it. And for some of you know um, that are pretty close to me, I, I don't have a problem reaching out and trying to help uh, discuss these issues if it would ever come up and it was everyday life or if I had a way to discuss it with some of you. So let me go into some of the deaths and dying. Uh, first of all, my uh, first steps in death was uh, 1998, August 22nd, which would happen to be two days before my mom and dad's anniversary. Um, I took my ex-girlfriend at the time to the hospital. Uh, seemed like a normal everyday event. She was in labor. We get there and uh, everything was going normal. And then all of a sudden, uh, things took a drastic change. They went in and did an emergency C-section. Uh, during that time, uh, when they re removed the baby, um, turned out the baby was in cardiac arrest. No breathing, no pulse. So believe it or not, in the state of Pennsylvania, not sure if it occurs that way in every other state, um, it was determined that it was stillborn because the baby never took a breath, never had a pulse when it was born, even though the baby was full term. That was a tough thing in my life. Um, like I said, that was in 1998. Um, me and her are no longer together. Uh, we are still friends on Facebook. Um, but some of the things that have occurred is one, just the stress of that occurring uh, was tough. I uh, didn't deal with it as well. I buried myself in my work. Uh, I was working two full-time EMS jobs, so she didn't have to work. She also had a daughter uh, from a previous relationship that I was taking care of along with her. So all she had to do was uh, stay at home, and if she wanted to work, she could, or if she didn't, she would be home to spend time with the, the children at that time. Um, when I look back on it, it was probably one of the worst things I could have done is the, is the uh, burying myself in my work by working two full-time jobs. Uh, being an EMS, I was working one week uh, over 100 hours. My second week was between 60 and 80 hours a week. So I wasn't really home um, that much. Um, but at that point, it was to deal with the stress that I was dealing with and to be able to pay bills. So um, that's things you gotta look at. At that time, my amount of time I could take off of work was limited. Um, 
I think I was given a week, maybe two weeks, to deal with the whole process, which when you look at it is really not that long of a time to deal with it. Um, because the grieving process of death, minimum, minimum, is 30 days uh, of uh, post-traumatic. Um, and it can go a lot longer, depending on how you were affected by the incident. So, um, I did have a funeral, a burial service, including a cemetery gravesite for my son. Um, still try to go up there minimum of two to three times a year with my current wife and my son. Um, some of the other uh, reasons we go up there that much is uh, both my mom and dad are also buried at the same cemetery. So that does help a little bit. Besides the the uh, dying aspect of the baby, um, in 2008, I was working uh, in Lancaster teaching. And back then, my policy was you turn off your phone, um, you never answer your phone when you're teaching. And I learned all that changed. Um, on that day, it was in the uh, early afternoon. Uh, I turned my cell phones back on after I was done teaching and noticed I had multiple phone calls from my mother. Uh, when I called her, my mom was uh, uh, a mess because it turned out my father was airlifted from uh, our house to a uh, specialty hospital, which is over an hour away. My mom is not a, um, a driver that, that can do that unless somebody would guide her and be in the car with her. So at that point, uh, I called my boss and explained the situation because I was actually teaching for them. And I was actually two hours plus away from my mom's house. So they offered to pick up my mom and to take her to the hospital. And I would drive from where I was to the location uh, where my dad was, which was in a, a uh, specialty hospital in Bethlehem. I left Lancaster and made it from Lancaster to Bethlehem in just over an hour and a half, um, which was probably one of the worst things to do is when you're under that stress is to be driving. But uh, I knew how important this was. Um, one, I wanted answers. What was going on? It sounded like he suffered a stroke. Uh, due to the weakness, slurred speech, my mom was describing. Um, but it actually turned out he actually had what we call a um, head bleed. When I arrived at the hospital, my dad was already in a coma uh, in the ER yet, which was an hour and a half, two hours, which is unusual for them to be still be stuck in the ER uh, at that time. But due to him being unstable, they couldn't bring him to the floor. So what happened then is they eventually did bring him up. Um, my mom did arrive after I did. Um, and we were briefed on his current condition, which included he was on a ventilator. Um, they were going to have to operate due to the uh, brain uh, bleed, uh, due to the brain being shifted, due to the blood clot. He had about a 78 centimeter shift of his brain. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And uh, at that point, their number one priority was to take care of the clot and the bleed. They did um, do that. At what point, um, the next 24 to 48 hours, he did have a little bit of hand grasp. Uh, didn't open his eyes. Um, didn't really respond besides if we would talk to him. So he was still in a coma state on the ventilator at that point. Um, as his condition changed again for the worse, would now become non-responsive again. They went in and did a second operation where they actually tapped into the ventricles to try to get the blood out of the ventricle areas of the brain. Um, 
hoping that would solve it. Um, what they found out, there was bl blood in the ventricles, and at that point, there was no easy solution. Um, I forget how many days into this, we finally had to make that decision of, do we leave him on a ventilator the rest of his life? And he would be in a coma state. And uh, talking to my mom, my mom says, no, that's not what he wanted. So I had to make those decisions to be the one to go to this hospital with my dad, along with the family and the priest, and tell my dad that it would be okay if he uh, moved on and went to a better place. That was the second hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, nobody will realize how hard that is to have that talk, to let that person know we'll be okay. Um, and that was in 2008. At that time, um, I was not married, did not have my own family. Um, at what point, uh, being single, at that time, I offered to move back home to try to help my mom with the house. Um, realizing that was a priority to take care of my mom. Um, back in that happened for maybe a year that I was living back home. I did find my current wife. We started dating, um, moved in together and, uh, started having our own family. Uh, we would go up and visit my mom. In uh, 2013, my mom started having some problems. Um, took her to the specialist, which turned out they uh, found that she had bladder cancer after doing a lot of uh, testing. And uh, it was stage four. And the treatment was um, keep her comfortable. There was no solution. Um, they gave her, without chemo, eight months. With chemo, maybe a year. Um, being in healthcare like I am, we uh, discussed this with the doctors. My mom did not want to be involved in the conversation. So I did ask the doctors, including the chemo doctor, what his thoughts were. And they said that for what you're going to gain of an extra two to four months, sometimes the sickness is worse than anything. So at that point, I had to make those decisions again and let my mom know that it was terminal. And uh, she understood that. Um, in November of 2013, she actually, around Thanksgiving, came to move into my house with me, my wife, and my son. Uh, at which point, she was still independent somewhat. Um, but we were able to keep better eye on her. We did have hospice coming in. Um, to help with bath stuff like that, uh, and check on her two times a week because of our work schedules. Um, as it progressed in uh, January of 2014, uh, things started to take a drastic slide that she was no longer able to walk due to the progression of the disease. And I think it was January the 20th of 2014 is when she passed away at my house. You're going to have to bear, bear with me. Um, I'm probably going to get somewhat emotional here. Um, I will tell you from experience, if you deal with hospice, it is not a easy task to deal with. I will tell you from my experience personally, it is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Because as they progress with this disease, you may have to scream and yell at them and treat them almost like a child to get them 
to understand they can't get up and walk because their legs don't work. Or when you're pushing medications to make them comfortable, realizing that eventually these medications are what's going to cause their demise to stop breathing to make them comfortable. Um, I will tell you, it was a long, rough two weeks, the last two weeks of her life, because of her not being able to walk and wanting to use the bathroom and couldn't. Uh, even though she had the pull-ups on and everything, she just, not the way that life was meant to be. So, um, the last day of her life, um, as she took the turn, um, we noticed that she started to uh, model on her extremities. She did have what we call the agnal breathing or death rattle with the gurgling noise. Uh, that went on for almost 48 hours. Um, and then uh, at which time uh, we were with her when we seen the modeling going on where her lower legs start to get white like a waxy type um, feeling to them. We started to talk to her. Uh, her eyes did open. She could not talk. Um, I delet her no. It was okay. If she wanted to go on. And uh, the tears started coming out of her eyes. And uh, she blinked to let me know she acknowledged me. And then she took her last breath. That is probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Is dealing with that type of death. So I wanted to bring it to people's attention. Dealing with death is not going to be easy. In everyday life, it's never easy. But I want you to realize that if this is a disaster, or if this is another uh, type of an event, are we prepared? And how can you prepare yourself? So enough about my death and dying experiences. Uh, I think it's important to realize that it can happen. So I want to talk a little bit about um, common ways that we may be able to uh, die during a situation. That we could cause our own demise and death. How about poor water conditions from bacteria? Malnutrition be another cause um, diseases by insects respiratory disease and infections wounds and infections and in food borne uh, products some other things we got to think about is what when someone died what caused their death was it human cause or was it an illness cause uh, try to get the body away from the area. Keep it away from any type of water sources. Um, remember, how are you going to get rid of the body? Are you going to bury it? Or are you going to cremate it? Um, so that's some of the things you got to look at. Um, how prepared are you? You know, what was the cause? Was it an epidemic? where we have no hospital or the hospitals don't have beds? Uh, are we able to take care of our own people, give them oral hydration, and how to clean the uh, bedding and stuff if you didn't have normal means? Uh, large disasters like earthquake, uh, hurricanes, stuff like that. Uh, in an emergency, we're not going to have a lot of time to think about things. We're going to have to deal with it and move on. Uh, only because during a, a disaster or collapse situation, that's how we're going to have to deal with it. 
So that's important to realize. Um, some things to think about um, in preparing for caring for people that are going to die. If possible, collect medications that can assist them with uh, pain management. Let me pause this real quick. I've got to check my phone. Sorry about that. That was the wife calling, so I had to answer that. Um, but um, to get back, how do you prepare for the dying is one um, about the medications. Um, another thing is, is sometimes with certain pain medications, the patient may become constipated, which can also cause pain and discomfort. So do we have stuff that we can use for that, laxatives or stool softeners or enema, stuff like that. Uh, having stuff so if they can't get to the bathroom, diapers uh, or uh, chuck pads, something you can put under to absorb that fluid if that would happen. Another thing is, is um, what I've seen with my mom was some people say about lip balms or uh, getting like a um, Q-tips or some type of thing, a swabs for for the the mouth. So if they get dry mouths or the lips, that way you can wet them. Uh, skin lotions for the skin. If it, you know, sometimes they'll get dry skins. Um, sometimes in dying process, the uh, body's ability to clot blood is impaired leading to bleeding through the nose, mouth, uh, rectum, and skin. So if that happens, you got to be prepared for that. Uh, not only for, for your distress level, but also for them. So uh, having extra or darker colored sheets and towels set aside uh, in a kit when you're dealing with this type of event could be uh, important. Uh, having protection for yourself. Um, Gloves, uh, maybe uh, N95 masks, not regular surgical masks. These are specialty masks. Uh, eye protection in the event the illness is contagious so that you can deal with the death and dying process. Um, also, be preparing to care for the caretaker, the person that's dealing with that person. One, grow strong in their faith, prayer, read scriptures, recall God's promises. A lot of times, that's part of the dealing process. Also, it can help the person that's dying. Uh, sometimes they're scared when they're dying. They'll have questions about what it's going to be like. Um, so having somebody that's strong in the religious aspect that can discuss it with them. Uh, like with my mom, we had three or four different ministers come in um, to talk to her, which gave her different views. Uh, take breaks is another per thing for the caretaker. Um, because if you're exhausted, you're not going to be any help. Me and my wife took turns with my mom. Um, at the end, the last two weeks, I actually physically took off from work and was uh, helping being around her because of her trying to get out of bed and couldn't walk. Uh, another important aspect that we don't think about is hydrating ourselves along with eating properly. If you can't sleep, at least try to take cat naps or rest. Uh, share your sorrows with others and reach out for help. Don't be afraid to say, I need help. I don't care if you're male or not. Um, sometimes we need to talk to others. Um, don't keep children away, but do explain to them what's happening if they understand. Um, let them help get things. Uh, that's what we used to do with my son. At that time, he was only three, 
Um, and I asked the hospice nurse, what do you do? Because near the end, when she was gurgling and stuff, he would make fun of her or repeat her sound, I should say. Not make fun of her, but repeating her sounds. And they physically said, just go along with it. Don't um, acknowledge it. What he's doing, there's nothing wrong with it. So that's another thing that we got to look at when we're dealing with this. With the uh, death and dying process. What to do with the kids. How do you explain to them when after that person dies, where'd they go? Um, what we did is we used a fiber optic angel. And that's what we used to explain it to my son. That um, the angel's watching over him. And so he understood that sort of, considering how young he was. Um, during the dying process, what do we do and how do we support that person? Um, the two biggest thing is comfort. And normally those people do not want to be left alone. Uh, they want somebody there with them. Uh, find out what their wishes are. Um, some of the older people, they always say if when they pass or move on that you should open the window to allow their spirit or their soul to go out. Um, that's what we did with my mom. So uh, always have that understanding. Uh, remember to follow their lead when they, with their own recognition of mortality and how they want to deal with it. Uh, they may have an extra burst of energy. Um, when my mom, that did happen, probably two weeks before for the bad day, day um, she ate a crazy amount of food because before that she was living on a can of pears every few days is what she would eat. That's all she could stomach. She would drink fluid, but that was about it. Um, They may go into a baby position or fetal position is another one. Um, but the bad part is we never know how long it will be take. Um, remember, don't force them to eat if they can't eat. It's not because they don't want to. It's because it doesn't taste right. Uh, it may be the textures. Um, but allow them to take whatever they can um, can get in, uh, but never force them to. Um, they may be increased fatigue and weakness and increased sleeping. Remember to allow them to sleep if they need it. Um, loss of bowel and bladder, I did discuss. Um, remember, keep the person as comfortable as possible. Put a pad under that person. Um, they may get itching. This may happen as a result of kidney failure or with dehydration. Their, their skin gets very itchy sometimes. We can treat that with lotion. Benadryl sometimes may work also. As it progresses, they they're mentally can be confused. Uh, remember, even if they're confused, don't argue with them if you can avoid it. Um, just try to listen to them. They may talk about all different types of stuff. People they may see, including dead relatives. Um, so you want to be careful of stuff like that. You may see their extremities, such as their feet and ankles area start to swell due to the kidney issues where the kidneys start to fail, the gurgling sound or labored breathing. Uh,
This may be distressing to you as a rescuer, but a lot of times it doesn't mean that the person is in distress per se. Um, biggest thing there is cleaning the airway. Try to get that fluid out of there if that's the case. Um, the other thing is, remember, how do you know if that person died? Uh, no breath or pulse. Able to detect the pupils become dilated. Jaw may be relaxed and mouth slightly open. They may lose control of all bowels um, and bladder and skin may become cool and, and uh, cold to touch are just some of the signs of death and dying. Um, I wanted to bring, bring it out. There's a lot more I could discuss, um, but I'm trying to keep it within a reasonable time frame. Uh, I'm over the 30 minute mark, which is a long time for me to do a video, but I want you to understand a little bit about death and dying. And if you have specific questions, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to me. Um, I think I put my email address on the end of my, my uh, YouTube stuff. Um, if not, if you're in any of the chats and I'm in there, please let me know. Uh, I think it's very important to understand the death and dying. It's like anything. Uh, it's like psychological first aid. Sometimes being able to make a person feel a little more comfortable is going to be tough. Um, but realize you being there with them may be what helps them the most. Uh, being a provider for many, many years, sometimes this is tough to teach people. Um, one, I can't save everybody. And two, no matter how much I do, that person may still die. The big things, and I'm not sure where I read this, but I wrote this down. I thought it was important. You must choose to embrace when it comes. Or we can choose to fight till the last. Uh, I think it's an important title, saying, whatever you want to consider it. Um, so hopefully you'll get a chance to look at this video. Um, it was not an easy thing for me to talk about. Um, and I want you to understand that it's part of human nature, but together as a family, we can better deal with it. So for now, it's Rescue Boss signing off. Uh, hopefully you have a great day. If you have any questions, let me know. If not, till my next video, thank you for listening.